from Luke chapter 10. If I can get there. Verse 25. It's a part of scripture that you're probably very familiar with. I think this could go down just a little bit. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? The expert answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and then when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. The word of the Lord. Just a quick introduction of ourselves, you know a little bit about us, but I grew up in Peoria, Illinois, went to Richwoods High School, and then went to Illinois State University where I met my wife, and we were married in 2002 and have lived in Indiana since that time. I worked at YMCA Camp Tecumseh for 13 years. I don't know if any of you are familiar with YMCA Camping and Camp Tecumseh, but a very large camp just across the border there in Indiana. Uh, easy for me to say, huh? <laughs> uh, you know my wife grew up here in Paxton Loda, went to PBL, and then to Illinois State University. Do you want me to share anything else about you? Okay. <laughs> um, she's worked in different places, a lot with people with disabilities, and. Um, we now have three children, Mark, <laughs> Miriam, who is adopted from Bulgaria. She's there. Put your hand up real high, Miriam. There you go. And then Aaron, who you saw playing with the bungee cord back here earlier. <laughs> so, our three children. Uh, many years ago, God started moving on our hearts about missions, and God moved on my heart and said, you need to do something different than YMCA camping. And I said, okay, what? And he said, hold on. I said, okay. <laughs> Wasn't ready for it yet, apparently. So he slowly told me that you were going to do missions. And I said, where? He said, hold on, man. And then eventually he told me, you're going to do missions in Africa. I said, with who? Hold on. <laughs> and my wife wasn't quite at that place where she was ready to go do missions in Africa yet. So. Slowly he worked on both of our hearts and got us to move to Malawi. We were originally slotted for Kenya, and then God changed that and put us in Malawi. And so five years ago, two days ago, we landed in Malawi. So five years and two days ago, uh, we've been in Malawi. Africa. So what is it like to just pick up, move your family, and go 8,000 miles away to Malawi? There is Malawi, it's in Africa. A lot of people say, is that in Hawaii? 
<laughs> no, <laughs> it's in Africa. It's not Maui, it's Malawi. Uh, what is it like to move all the way across the world there? Well, I kind of equate it to being abducted by aliens. <laughs> if you think about it, stop for just a second. The language has changed. The body language has changed. The clothes, they've changed. The way people look has changed. Sometimes we didn't see a white face for weeks. The driving is on the other side of the road. It's different. The toilets, they're different. You can buy them on the side of the road and plop them down. There's your toilet. Dig a hole under it. And the toilets that are in our house, they look similar to the American toilets, but they flush on the opposite side, which after 30 some years was very confusing because I'm so used to one hand, but now I gotta switch that. The money is different. We've got some money at our table you can take a look at after the service. The way people view money is very different. And I could go on and on. Everything changed. We got on a big metal flying object and landed somewhere else, like being abducted by aliens. We kind of feel a little bit of what Miriam felt when she came over from Bulgaria. She was taken out of everything she knew and placed in our home. And some days you might feel like that with COVID. All of a sudden you got hand sanitizer in your packet, mask on your face, everything's different. And what did Jesus feel like? After sitting on the throne and then coming to earth as a baby, maybe he kind of felt like everything had changed and he was abducted by aliens. Okay, got a quiz for you, Pastor. Uh-oh. What's the shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept. Jesus wept in English. Nine letters, one space. In Chichewa, Exodo 20, verse 15. Usabe. Five letters. It means do not steal. But when we moved to Malawi, I looked at things very much based on my English yeah. American background, my culture, which is normal. And I want to give you a little perspective culturally of what I've learned since then. Originally, I looked at things like this and the, the shops. Then there's another shop he's got a picture of. And I saw poverty. I'm like, oh my goodness. The shop looks so worn down. It's so small. It's poverty. And then I saw, you can't see it too well, but this is a village that we drive through. And this is the road that we drive to get to one of our ministries. And I said, wow, the poverty that's there. And then I looked at women, like this next picture, carrying huge bags of things on their head. It's like 100 pounds, some of them. And water, carrying it for miles. And I said, oh, these poor women. And then after living there, now for five years, I see things differently. I look at those shops and I go, wow. In this land of extreme poverty, these people have a business. They're doing well, and they're entrepreneurs. They've started something on their own. That's fantastic. I look at the ladies carrying things on their head, and I say, man, they are strong. Very, very strong. And when they go to the well and sit there for hours waiting to pump water to carry it miles back home, they get to build community by conversing with the, the other ladies that are there with them. They've built strong community because of these things. And so my viewpoint has changed a lot since living in Malawi. So we're going to talk a little bit about who is our neighbor. Are these people your neighbors? Well, let's talk about that. The English word for neighbor came from Old English, two words that literally meant nearby dweller. Like you said, those that are nearby, close to you. And if you look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament, such as Leviticus 19, verse 16, says, do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. So there, your people and neighbor were put together, and those were your neighbors. The NIV has 141 verses that talk about neighbor. Most of them are love your neighbor. 
So we're going to look at that New Testament uh, verse that we I read just a few minutes ago. The verses I've read many, many times. And then I was given a book recently that talks about these verses based on the culture in the, that area where Jesus was talking, the Middle Eastern culture. And it gave me a new perspective, and I want to share some of that with you as well. Uh, verse 25, it starts out with the expert in the law, starting with the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, right off the bat, he's asking their own questions, because what can you do to get eternal life? You can't do any physical act to get eternal life. And to inherit, well, you can't get inherit passing down from ancestors or friends. You can't inherit eternal life from other people either. But Jesus responds very kindly, and he responds with an answer that has to do with the heart, to constantly love God and your neighbor. But to justify himself, verse 29 says the expert wanted to justify himself. He probably was looking for an Old Testament version of those neighbors that are nearby us, because Jesus said, love your neighbor. Well, Jesus, as he continued in verse 31, he understood his audience. His audience was an expert in the law, the Jew. So he started with the hierarchy in Jewish, Jewish culture. And he started with the highest person in that hierarchy, the priest. Everybody looks up to the priest. And he said, what did the priest do? Well, he walked by. Oh, the priest didn't do it. Why did the priest not do it? It's possible that the priest couldn't do it. If you're looking at the law, he might have had priestly duties to do and couldn't possibly take the chance of touching a person who might die and making himself unclean. So he passed by. Well, then you go down in the hierarchy. A Levite is underneath the priest. And he passed by. Okay. Maybe he had duties to do, or maybe he saw the example of the priest and had to follow that example. We're not sure in this example. But who would be next in the hierarchy? Priest, Levite, move on down. You've got the Jew. And maybe a high ranking Jew, someone who is an expert in the law himself. Maybe he's the hero in this story. And Jesus takes and he throws in a twist. And he says, nope. A Samaritan. A Samaritan is the one who is the neighbor who helps this guy out. He is your neighbor. I don't think that Jesus was trying to change the Old Testament version of who is your neighbor. Those nearby dwellers are still your neighbor. But now let's expand it and move it to those that don't look like you. They don't talk like you. The aliens, per se. <laughs> they are also your neighbor. But what about if those neighbors aren't kind? We had an experience in Malawi uh, about a year and a couple months ago to where we were driving back from doing some ministry in one of the villages. And we were taking the main road back to the city. There had been some demonstrations in the city that day due to political things that were going on. They didn't like the election. <laughs> the results of the election. They actually ended up overturning the election. No predictions here. But <laughs> just saying that's what happened in Malawi. But there were protests against the previous election, which had happened back in April, I think it was, and this was August. And so we were driving back late at night thinking it'll all be done, it'll be over. Well, some people in one of the villages had taken over the main road. They had placed huge stones in the road, built fires in the road to make you slow down and swerve all over the place. And then they were sitting on the side of the road waiting and throwing stones and bricks at the vehicles that were passing by. We were in a very large van because we had some visitors with us, our children were with us, and it was terrifying. It was a mile and a half going extremely slow, dodging these obstacles and being pelted, windows breaking everywhere. I say this for a couple different reasons. One, through this situation, we can give glory to God. Because after all these broken windows, our son, who is in his car seat, we picked him up, not a scratch on him. 
car seat just lined with shards of glass. Mm. Our daughter, who has a difficult time understanding that Jesus is coming back and going to take her to heaven, it's kind of scary for her. She said, Jesus was right here, sitting next to me, comforting me. And our son said the same thing, Mark. It's like, Jesus was with us through this situation. So we're not upset at these people. We could be. We could be, and I don't think anybody would have any qualm about us having some hard feelings against these people who put us through a traumatic situation. But we look at verses like Matthew 5, verse 43, starting at verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Not even the tax collectors are doing that. Even, are not even the tax collectors doing that. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Again, your neighbors are those people on the side of the road. And so we've been called to love them. And so our family has chosen to love the people of that village and continue to minister in Malawi. We're going to share a little bit more about our ministry and our neighbors using a video that was created by um, a supporter